This is a Play Your Way Network presentation. Get the full story at PlayLifeYourWay.com. Three champions rose to show you how to curate your lifestyle and entertainment. Now, they've accepted the call to help you debate and rank the stuff you love. Play Your Way Network presents the weekly top five podcast, The Player Way. Weekly top five podcast, <laughs> bringing it to you. The player way. Along with my co-captains, Derek. Corrupting the system you already know. Here for the top five. And Nate. <clears throat> That's me. Exactly. We are killing it absolutely every single week. The player way. Yes, I am your resident podcast, DJ BK. Help me understand to curate your life and media the player way. And uh, my co-captains, episode two of Weekly Top 5 Podcast, the PG version of the Playaway Podcast, where we help you curate your lifestyle, your favorite things in life, the player way. And in this particular week, keeping in, in the same train of thought that we've been going along with since episode one, we gave you the top five films of all time. This week, the amazing writers of the Play Your Way Network um, headed and spearheaded by uh, Ian Robert Parsons, our, our senior writer for this column. Um, he came up with a really cool idea of us doing the top directors of all time. It did also come out of our conversation in the last episode as well. Uh, and the week after that, we're probably going to also be wanting to talk about um, the best actors, uh, male or female all in the same list so that's coming as well um as you heard the man say at the top of the of the show uh the weekly top five podcast is presented by presented by play your way network and agency cartel clothing company the official clothing for grind time that's exactly right you want to look fresh go to agencycartel.com and that's how we absolutely do it the player way all right so to get us started off we don't ever do our top five based on what our just preferences are yes the three of us are guys from different walks of life different types of jobs and such and the way we consume our media seasons in how we uh consume and and curate our media okay so what we are going to do is leading off with uh nate Let's go, uh, Nate, you got that list from the writers, or the Play Your Way Network writers, uh, again, headed up by uh, uh, Ian Parsons for this particular episode and list. Uh, give us what their honorable mentions were first and foremost. In no particular order, we have Chris Nolan, Guy Ritchie, the Coen Brothers, Spike Lee, and Francis Ford Coppola, winemaker. There you go. <laughs> they they have a a, a, a wonderful um, white Zinfandel. Yeah, I, I find it both complicated yet enticing and refreshing at that. Indeed, indeed, <laughs> not too dry. All right, and then uh, Derek, uh, he's got the IMDb top uh, of all time. So what we're going to do is the honorable mentions are going to be there. Six through ten, I guess. 6 through 10, so go ahead and give us just the 6 through 10 for now in no particular order. All right, no particular order. We got Woody oh, Allen. Hey, you guys, I'm glad to make it to your list. Roman Polanski. And Christopher nine. Walken is there. <laughs> wow, your car is alive. Two, two very controversial directors. <laughs> very, very. Yeah, they cool. are. Roman Polanski. Annie Hall's a good movie, though. Yeah. Uh, D- David Fincher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> James Cameron. And uh, number six, Christopher Nolan. So another, in essence, honorable mention. So Dun, dun. Yeah. Dun, dun. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right, so, so that's what's going on down there on uh, the honorable mentions. I guess we should go around the circle and uh, talk about... It began with the honorable mentions. All right, honorable mentions, starting with yours, Nate. I only have two. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Scorsese and Tarantino. Tarantino's on mine for sure. I was going to say Tar- Tarantino. Um, I was also going to say, and again, this is more of my personal preference. Um, Sly Stallone. 
uh, he gave us the Rocky franchise and to do that many films, I feel like he gets, uh, and he's done other great films as well, action films. Um, I feel like he kind of doesn't get enough shine, uh, especially when you start talking about what we consider are the best directors and, and we start whittling it down. Derek, what are yours? I have a, a handful of them. <clears throat> uh, Clint Eastwood, Ryan Coogler, uh, the uh, M. Night Shyamalan. I love how he tells stories. I mean, he might not always have the type of Sometimes. movies that people want to, um, <laughs> but I enjoy how he how he directs stories, uh, at, at least. Uh, Charlie Chaplin, just for the sake of groundbreaking um, and film film history, uh, as well as, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned Tim Burton, but uh, Tim Burton as well. So That's what's up. That mm-hmm. sounds like it sounds like a solid list there. And uh, one of the exclusives that we're going to give you. Exclusive. The player way. Exclusive. All has to do with how we're going to be uh, judging our top five. So uh, with no further ado. And then it was time for the top five. All right. So our top fives are going to be judged by something that I was inspir- inspired uh, by, by Nate, actually. So shout out to you, Nate. Nate uh, talks about what makes an amazing comic book adaptation is heart, humor, and spectacle. Um, and so that's something that inspires us every single week. And so um, I wanted to do a similar type of rubric with the directors. However, it doesn't quite work that way. The business of directing a film is essentially taking something that is intellectual property, um, is a work of art, whether it be fiction or biographically based, It is still taking something that is intangible and making it into a business, not just making it tangible, but making it into a business that can sustain itself. And in today's world, it's all about making sequels. A lot of the people that are going to be on our list are people who are able to sustain the business and renegotiate to keep that business alive for even generations. Uh, or at least a single generation, okay? So when we talk about directors, my co-captains, I want you guys to think about three things, and we're going to judge each one based on these three things to kind of keep it organized for the listeners because they love to hear us give them bullet points. So um, with no further ado, bullet point number one, story. So our, our director is going to be judged by their ability to, to judge what is a good story and then taking that story and judging what parts of it need to make it into the screen and making sure that we're able to digest it. Uh, The second uh, rubric we're judging by is scale. So no film is uh, a film without calendaring and budgeting. Their ability to scale that story up and making it into something that's tangible. And of course, the name of the game, number three, is success. So how successful the director was in bringing that story, scaling it for human consumption and mass wide distribution, and then success and i know that people say well it's the producer's job bk to make sure that people get paid and people get laid yeah i get that i understand that person who is a sayer of nay but understand that without the director you definitely can't do a film the player way okay so directors they get all of the they get the goobin they get all of the accolades for a reason okay so calm down michael bay all right, so there we go. It's time for the top five. We're going to do it like we always do at this time. Nate, give us your number five. But first, give us the top five from the Play Your Way Network, five starting all the way down to their number one. Okay. At number five, it's David Fincher. Number four, Martin Scorsese. Number three, Alfred Hitchcock. Number two, Tarrant Quinton. Tarantino and number one is one Steven Spielberg. There you go, Derek. What is the top five from IMDb's list? Top five to give us a baseline. We have number five Billy Wilder. Um, Surprised that uh, that one didn't come up. Number four Quentin Tarantino, and number three David Lynch. Number two Alfred Hitchcock, and number one Stanley Kubrick. Number one on the IMDb's list? Wow. Yep. Interesting. All right, there you go. And now it was time for our top five. Number five. Nate. 
Okay, so again, by no means are my picks you know, part of the film again. Let's These back up my, again. Let's back it up again. Like I had did. And so I get it, Nate. You got you feel like um, it's only week two. Hold on, it's only week two. So let me explain it like I did last week. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between, with all due respect, the way our lists tend to go based on that uh, rubric of story, scale, and success, Nate tends to go based on what was a more of a worldwide appeal. He's a guy who did not necessarily grow up in the United States at the very beginning. On top of that, he's all about replay value. Okay. So did it have worldwide appeal and did it penetrate? All right. Penetration is everything when it comes time to getting the business done. All right. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, did I do I did I mess up? No. Is, is that no. earmuffs. What? Earmuffs. What? That is not earmuffs. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you trying to say that I hold on, are you trying to give me that? <laughs> Are you trying to say it's a technical difficulty right now? No, it is. How is that a technical difficulty? Come on, <laughs> not taking the time. Explain to, to the people. I'm not tripping it over is this. PG. That that was look. That was a double on top. That means two things. I was. I, I will have Whoa, you know. Okay, what's this? <laughs> I was talking about the penetration of other markets. Okay, oh, okay, okay. penetrating yes, the world yes, markets. Yes, okay, world it is markets. all about when you're and getting the job done is selling these films to other countries. Okay, uh, something you can nothing. salivate I will over. This. Okay, I got you. All, all right, right, you want to sell what there you can you salivate go. on? Try, all right, exactly. And and, and I, it sounded like you said a valid bleed over. No. Never during that period of time uh, are we trying to do never that. No, it's a, what? no, 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 that, look, no, Mike. no, 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 that, no, we're we're safe. So here, Nate okay? likes to go with safe. rewatchability. <laughs> Re- yes, exactly. Rewatchability is Jump. Nate. Okay, Derek is all about. Derek is all about um, the cerebral, the the thing that really blows your mind. Like I blew his mind just a little bit ago. Pause. Um, all about just really the, the twists, the turns, the things that are just refreshing that saying, man, I've never seen that in film. The things that change things forever and, and become a part of your lexicon on a daily basis. Okay. If it's got good screenwriting, most likely it's going to be uh, on Derek's list. And then of course, BK is the art student. Of course, in addition to being a resident podcast DJ, he is a, uh, independent film, um, guy. I'm all about. Um, looking at how a guy was able to do what they did with the technology they had at the time. Do, I know every single role from gaffer to grip to AD to director of photography to producer to director. I know what every job is, and I know where – when I see a film, I could t- see where things fell apart. So how did this work as a business, at, in the business of film and the impact it made on the 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 – art of filmmaking in the future so there you go that's what nate is trying to say encapsulating and all that so keep that in mind as he gives his uh a number five pick number five so my number five is the newest uh out of this list um it's a duo by the name of the russo brothers <laughs> nice who russo i brothers. think Obviously, we know their work with Marvel, but I think they've set the standard of what an ensemble movie should be. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know this is film directors, but I don't, you can't, their TV work can't go unnoticed either. You know, their spearheaded Arrested Development um, community, Happy Endings. Increasingly Poor Decisions of Todd Margaret. I don't know if you guys ever watched it, but, you know, They've directed a number of episodes from all those series. So they can do drama. Obviously, their action, I think, has thrown... It set the precedent of comic book movie action with Winter Soldier. And and they can do drama, as we've seen in Infinity War. So I'm excited to see where their careers progress to after, you know, Avengers 4. But, I I mean, the two of them together are just... There you go. Bold choice for top five of all time. (gasps) Hey, but I got to respect it. I respect it. I know a lot of people out there heard that, but that's what it's all about. We told you what it was all about, and Nate loves the replayability of the stuff that the Russo brothers directed. Got to respect it. Go on right on over to Mr. Corrupting himself to erect it. (laughs) My number five is uh, the director of one of my all-time favorite movies, and I enjoy every every one of his his movies that he puts out there. Um, for the, for the most part, it's Steven Spielberg. 
Uh, I enjoy nice. cinematic adventures almost every time. And I, I remember when I watched Close Encounters of the Third Kind on VHS, because I am that old, and um, just being uh, amazed and thinking it was a new movie. And as you mentioned earlier, BK, being able to do something with the technology at the time, to where it may still have that replayability, still have that that value, and you know they re- recently remastered this. Um, I want to say about half a year ago, and put this back out in the theater, and we talked about that on the Playaway yeah. podcast. And I just I, I enjoy the stories. I, I feel like it's it's that fun feeling. It's it's way to capture that mysticism that is going to the movies and seeing an adventure. Uh, that you can relate to, and Steven Spielberg is, I feel like, the the pinnacle of that. We're going to talk a little bit more about Steven Spielberg. I got a feeling as we move along, so yes, we'll, I will table my additional comments until later. Number five for me is going to be uh, Mr. Inception himself. Maybe that's the reason why I even put him on the list. Maybe Wrong. he incepted this exactly christopher nolan is my number five i know he's going to end up on this list again so i'm going to keep it at that for now (laughs) exactly all right so we're just going to move a little bit on down the uh, food chain number four number four for me is david fincher david Um, fincher nice i fell in love with his work through fight club but through that i've seen his previous work i mean we can Aliens 3 was a bit suspect, but, you know, it's there. But 7, the game, Panic Room, Zodiac. You know, I feel Space like Aliens 3 is, is a little underrated. If you look at all of the Alien films, um, Alien 3 has its place. I'll say that. I watched it. Well, too I will. Ago. Alien 3 and the girl with the dragon tattoo are probably Man. my least two favorite of yeah, the films. Yeah, I can't get through a um, uh, girl with the dragon tattoo. That's all. That's yeah. a hard chew for me. Yeah, it's it a is. slow but, film. Um, you know, outside of that, have the European versions work, on I've Netflix. All so, those movies. So. Yeah. yeah, those are even harder to watch. I'm sorry. I, don't know. <laughs> I, just, I don't know about those films. <laughs> Moving around on number four. <laughs> number four for me is uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the master of suspense himself, Alfred Hitchcock. I'm just going to throw it out there, man. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I, I he love will watching. definitely be on this list again. I, I, all right. Well, then I'm, I'm going to leave it at that then. We'll we'll, we'll geek out there about that go. later. We're going to geek out about that in just a little bit. Where's Darren Marlar uh, at number- with, those, with, the, with that sweet, majestical voice? Where's he at right now? Hey, I already gave the number four. We're still in the number four round. All right, and number four for BK is Steven Spielberg. Nice. Um, Steven Spielberg, <clears throat> it, of all of the directors on this list, in my opinion, he is the best, yeah, at least best on my list, okay? And probably of all the directors that will appear on this list, he has had the longest run of hit films, okay? So with time, he, he didn't. he's not uh, with age, um, gone down in quality and he changes with the times um he's a director that when you see a steven spielberg film the 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 feeling of the time um his his films despite them being a time capsule of the period in which the film was made they have they age well still they age like fine wine instead of vinegar okay um you have a situation with Steven Spielberg with the original Jurassic Park that uh, what the time period in which it was made, the 90s, um, it, there's a 90s sensibility about that film that when you see Jurassic World, it's what Jurassic World is based upon. The philosophy of the 90s and what, the, and what America was about in the 90s, what the world was about in the 90s, is inside of that time capsule that is Jurassic Park. When you go back and watch that film, you know for sure that movie was intended to be in the 90s. It's supposed to stay there, and the things that age with it only enhance the film. Okay, Unlike Star Wars with George Lucas, you feel the 70s on the screen in a, in a film that's not supposed to take place in the 70s. Okay, But... It's still there. The funk of it is all over that film, and it's part of what makes it hard for that film to watch. But E.T., when you go back and watch it, 
it's it's the 80s and in, in what the 80s was about you feel it in that film okay Absolutely. The, the Jurassic Park you feel it in that film okay Close and then, as you move forward you, it, you feel it. in time with Ready Player 1 there's a sensibility of the 21st century in that film even though it was inspired by a man who was in, who, who a game creator and developer who was born in the 80s it it changes and it ages with time but it has the things that you love about that time period perfectly encapsulated so um, i'm gonna call him the time capsule director on this episode definitely dubbing him the player way so there you go that's that's steven spielberg and i wouldn't be surprised if we saw him again but he might we may not all right so um anything else to add on steven spielberg before we move on nope. yes ladies and gentlemen he is paying us so so we'll let you know that okay <laughs> <laughs> all on the pineapple and moving on <laughs> Number three. Number three for me, and this could be solely based on the uh, Back to the Future movies, mm-hmm. but he's done so much Robert more Zemeckis? Than Robert Zemeckis. Nice! Um, I love it. I'm so glad that somebody mentioned Robert Zemeckis. He couldn't make it on yeah. my list, but I'm glad somebody mentioned him. There's a lot that he's done, and I'll, I'll watch every movie he comes out with. Not every single one of them is a masterpiece, but mm-hmm. I feel like a big part of my childhood is due to Robert Zemeckis with the Back to the Future movies, Contact, Forrest Gump, Death Becomes Her, you know, um, Castaway, shit. Yep. Who knew you wanted to watch Tom Hanks on the screen yep. for two hours with no one else? There you go. Robert Zemeckis. I give it to you. I'm cool with Robert <laughs> yeah. Zemeckis, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. Bro. And... He was a pioneer in, you know, before he started to do, like, the motion capture and all that stuff, before it really caught on really big. Now, now in all Express. fairness, now in all fairness, Back to the Future, Steven Spielberg's got a piece of that as well, right? As executive producer, but exactly. Back to the Future was directed by... I got you, I got you. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just saying number four, my number four, got a little piece of that action. He got a little shield with the uh, atom bomb in the space action. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Number three. My number Derek. three is uh, is J.J. Abrams. Um, I, I appreciate Yay. his directing style. He has a very... Uh, Another person that got a little bit of the pineapple from, from hmm. Steven Spielberg a couple times, man. Right? Yeah. Um, Big fan of that lens flare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I enjoy... Um, I mean, you you know it's a J.J. Abrams film when you're when you're watching, it, which I, I feel like that's an obvious statement. However, when you're talking about specific and, and these level this level directors, especially for me, you just have that feeling mm-hmm. like uh, like as you were speaking about Steven Spielberg, you know, had t- teleports you to that time. Abrams is pretty good at that as well. Like even if Super Eight mm-hmm. kind of falls apart with the the revealing of the alien, and then you're not really as worried about it. You feel like you yeah. are directly in the decade, right there with those kids. Kind of like uh, that feel that you get in Stranger Things. Uh, one, one of the things that I appreciate when you can actually transport yourself as a consumer, and you feel like you're there, and you're just right along with the story. Um, I appreciated his take on Star Trek. He kind of revitalized that whole franchise, and just um, you know, even down to TV shows Lost, and um, you know all that. I mean, I I really like his work. I agree. I, I believe that J.J. Abrams is the elder statement, elder statesman of film in his generation in the same way that Dave Grohl is the elder statesman of rock. Like, <clears throat> rock is a is a dying genre of music, um, it, it, but <gasps> it's still alive because of guys like Dave Grohl. You know, um, rock's not dead, man. It's more alive than ever. Exactly. But Dave Grohl's a big <laughs> part of Manson why it's there. And J.J. Brett. Specific take on this. And, yeah, and J.J. Abrams is is the guy within his generation, our generation, who is keeping the sensibility alive of George Lucas and of Steven Spielberg to make sure that the things we loved about films as kids don't get thrown out with the M. Night Shyamalan. So, <clears throat> and that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> There's so many directors out here that are just trying to kill the past, destroy it, you know, and then... J.J. Abrams is the guy that come, has to come through and fix it when they do that. You know what I'm saying? You, you hear what I'm doing there? With Star Trek? No, no. With I literally, y'all, y'all missed it. I, I laid it out for you. Is he? There's some directors out here. Take two. There's some directors out here who want to just kill the past, destroy it, and then you got to send J.J. Abrams in 
to fix it. Star, mm. Star Wars? Star Wars. Star Wars. Literally, that's okay. literally what's going to happen. Never mind, guys. <laughs> I <apologize>. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, I guess volleyball. I'll just move on to my number three then. <laughs> I'm gonna leave my joke out of this. So we can move on. <laughs> yeah, I watch ESPN. All right. <laughs> all right, all right. So, and my number three is Alfred Hitchcock. Um, Alfred Hitchcock for is more than just his name. Um, he is he's definitely the cock of the walk. He is the pound for pound greatest director of all time i'm saying that he is the floyd mayweather of his time when it comes to film the only reason why he's not at the top of this list is because he was he didn't have the benefit of the technology that the rest of these directors had and so you can't there's some storytelling that he just couldn't do um there's certain things that he couldn't venture into and on top of that he had some bill cosby-esque antics on set he was a weird kind of dude if you actually study alfred hitchcock he had a citizen kane in real life type of action Okay, so you can't really put Alfred Hitchcock at the top, but his influence cannot be denied. I don't even need to name his films and his television. You know in many this ways, there would be no. Say it again. Yeah, it, it, there would be no. There would be no Twilight Zone. There would be no Unsolved Mysteries. There would be no Lost. There would be no J.J. Abrams. There'd be none of these. The rest of the directors without Alfred Hitchcock, and that's all I got to say about that. The inventor of the MacGuffin. You know what I'm saying? The inventor of it. I mean, there you go. There you go, bro. That's all That's all that needs to be said. Number two. Number two for me is a highly underrated director who came out with a movie earlier this year called Death Wish. One Eli Roth. There you go. I appreciate that. I'm just that. joking. Actually, no. Number two for me is Steven Spielberg. But we've talked about him twice now. <laughs> I don't like the fact that you're taking advantage that I cannot curse on this edit. So I'm just going to say, you guys. Crime and You Netflix. over there. You know what you did. Steven Spielberg is. There you go. Uh. You know, responsible for a lot of things that brought a lot of movies that brought me happiness as a kid, and still to this day, um, I will check out his movies. Everyone he comes out with, just not as quickly as I used to. Yeah, I agree but, with that. You know, Super Eight was where we started to see his wrinkles a little bit, and he's well, not—he's not quite recovered from that. That was JJ. Well, <laughs> Steven Spielberg was part Spielberg. of that film. I. I could have swore he. I could have swore maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that. We'll do some fact checking on that uh, in the meantime. But yeah, um, but we'll move on. I was going to say War Horse. Was where I oh, see that. Tell. See, it didn't even occur to me to say that. It didn't even occur to me to say yeah. that. Jeez, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. All right. I, I think um, Spielberg does. He is like an executive producer on JJ's movies most of the time. But, yeah, yeah, but That's, that could be anything honestly yeah yeah there you go I, i'll say this and even if he's not a part of it he was copying spielberg so hard in that film mm. that it made me wonder it made me understand why i don't really check for et as much as as, a, as an adult you know what i'm saying yeah. like he hardcore copied steven spielberg in that film oh well, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, hardcore is a Hardcore Strong word. term. So, so, <laughs> hard, so, so. But yeah, I. In no, the sa- okay, word. I'll say it like this. No. In the same. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Go no. ahead, Derek. Well, I didn't know what phrase you were about to hit it with, but I was curious to see, though. Well, I was just. It, it just, okay. He copied Steven Spielberg in the same way he's copied George Lucas in, uh, in The uh, Force Awakens. J.J. Abrams is amazing at doing that. He's a maven at copying and pasting what works Plagiarism. for other directors. <laughs> I mean, that's what he does. And, and that's a, what Super Steven 8 is. Steven was a like producer it, on Super 8. He was a, a producer. That's what I thought. Yeah. Exactly. But, so but he's, one, one of a team how, of nine, but so was J.J. Abrams. He was also a producer. You know what and, I mean? and we all know how the pineapple goes around the table when J.J. Abrams and Spielberg get on the same um, set. So there we go. Moving along um, to Derek. My number two is uh, was, ha, has been mentioned, but um, one of my all-time favorite directors. I enjoy every single one of his films, and it's Quentin Tarantino. 
Um, I recently rewatched. Uh, I knew he would end up on somebody's list. Uh, I recently rewatched Hateful, Hateful Eight, Eight, which I really watched good. for the. Yeah. I watched back Underrated. in December of 2015, and I watched again a couple nights ago. And I was just like, man, Underrated. I should have had this on my honorable <laughs> mention for top films. I forgot how amazing the dialogue was, and it's just uh, and see, that was a return to form for me because I yeah. wasn't too fond of Django or Inglorious. Oh, yeah. see, Django's I, a good movie. Django's I talked really a lot good. of crap about Django. Django was I, not Django was ahead was of its bad. time. Django would have been perfect but, to come out right now. Like yeah. so, for it to come out right before all of this happened, it was a very timely film. And I didn't see Django until a couple of you. You years waited a while after it came out. I waited a while because I didn't like the subject matter and I didn't like his stance on how he handles certain subjects. And on top of that, I don't like Leo's too good of an actor. Yeah. You know, he, he plays a, <laughs> oh, a slave master too well. He, it's man. painful. It was very convincing. He, he's it was exquisite acting. Tarantino's it's next one. Acting. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. So that, I would but, love to see a. But, I was. I would love to see a. I would love to see a Tarantino helmed Joker standalone film. That'd be pretty. Yeah, I mean, hey, that's been that's that's been. I, I've read or some even or movies, even but, a Suicide Squad done by Tarantino would actually work. Heck yeah! Ooh. I mean, I've enjoyed his movies. Man. Reservoir Dogs, yeah. one of my favorites. Pulp Fiction. Of course. I mean, we got. I mean, it's you can't you you gotta appreciate his film. I I appreciate his films. Like if, Jackie Brown, one of his best. Man, films. man, Jackie Brown's so good. That guy, so good. <laughs> oh yeah, love it. Nice. That's my number. Two. All right, number two. Man, I got so engrossed in everything. I turned my list off, man. <laughs> uh, number two is going to be someone that people are going to be surprised that I put him uh, this high on the list. Mm. And despite despite the fact that his films, he lost his touch with telling a particular mm. type of story. It shows that he, this guy, got so he bought into his own hype so much. That he was he wasn't candid. He couldn't just tell us the truth. Uh, and that number two is George Lucas. Um, this guy, he, he, Star Wars was so big. Okay, it exceeded anything else that he had done. Even the fact that George Lucas is responsible for Happy Days. Like if it wasn't for him in American Graffiti, those characters would not have been invented and wouldn't have been able to be adapted to television. So the Cunningham family and all of them, the Fonz and all that, he, George Lucas was responsible for that becoming a part of of um, television history. And as you're starting to see a trend, these directors don't just direct film, they direct television as well. Now, even though he didn't direct the Happy Days uh, TV show, American Graffiti had a lot to do with it strongly, strongly, strongly inspired Happy Days down to the fact that the, some of the same actors ended up in the show. So it might as well have been him. Um, but no one talks about American Graffiti anymore. All, all the, when you talk about George Lucas, all you talk about is Star Wars. And Star Wars was so popular that he started to kind of buy into his own hype and, and saying that um, <clears throat> he had this story laid out from day one, which we know isn't true. It, it's very obvious as time has gone on that he was making it up as he went along, and he had a lot of writers writing it for him as it went along, okay? But that being said, for what he did, he took literally nothing and made it into a multi-billion with a B business, okay, to where he could sell this thing off and it's making even more money now. So no other director on this list has achieved that level of um, mythological storytelling and taking you know, miniatures and practical effects like George Lucas is responsible for that in, in many and much in the same way that Peter Jackson is responsible for reviving that with the whole Weta team. Uh, when he started talking about bigotures and everything for the Lord of the Rings saga, if not for George Lucas, you wouldn't be talking about it. Skywalker sound sound is still a part of the MCU and, st- and, and everything that you hear. Uh, Industrial Light and Magic, George Lucas is responsible for these things. All of these things, he took a group of people, much in the same way that you have the Play Your Way Network, a bunch of people just in a room talking about great ideas and cultivating this over time and making them Mm -hmm. into studios with an S that persist to this day in our money-making franchises. 
No other director has done it that way. Steven Spielberg uses, you know, um, Skywalker Ranch. Steven Spielberg, J.J. Abrams, they continue to use Skywalker Sound and... I mean, I mean, it goes on I wanted THX, to, man. I wanted to, to give him some credit. It was just hard for me to, in essence, just give him two movies, American Graffiti and Star Wars. You know, like, I, I, would, yeah, but, I wouldn't want to put him on a list for visionaries. Film. For visionaries. Fly boys but, or whatever. Yeah, you forget about Red Tails, too, bro. <laughs> he's Red not Tails. credited oh, yeah, as yeah, director. Tails, he's not credited as director. The last movie he was credited as a director for was Star Wars Episode Three. That was it. Well, He's Red Tails, he had director. a lot more to do with Red Tails. He has well, a lot might, more to do with He has Red a lot Tails more writing than credits than credit directing for. credits. He has like 150 writing credits. Exactly. But director, we're exactly. talking about directors here. If he Red Tails, Star Wars and I'm going I'm I'm to tell you something. I'm going to tell you, if Red Tails, as a guy who watched Red Tails and followed it a lot and what it was doing, George Lucas was all up in the making of stuff. If Red Tails had done better in theaters, you would have. he would be credited. But it's a weird thing how when things don't go so well, you hear different things. So I'm just saying, of anybody else on here, no one else has the same contribution level as George Lucas. I'd give him number one if he was a better storyteller. And that's all I got to say about that. And that's the bottom line. Because BK said so. (laughs) And uh, let's just move on along before um, someone decides to uh, usurp what I just had to say. And number (laughs) one. So, as probably yeah, you all know, bum, what bum. number one is. Uh, bum, bum. I understand that there are very revolutionary filmmakers that have come before, you know, the Hitchcocks, the Spielbergs, the Kubricks, all that. But I didn't grow up with them like I have with this guy watching his movies. And even to a point where I started appreciating film more than just watching a movie as your average consumer. Y'all are hearing you know, Nate read my thoughts care, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> the care that this guy puts into his movies. Is he movies your number one as well? Yes. Pre yes. Keep preaching, Nate. To production, the post-production. You know, even down to his marketing for you his are movies. Watching you know he has a work. say in all of it. Because he doesn't ever show too much in his trailers. And it's Christopher Nolan. I love... Every single movie he does come out. I think even his worst movie is still better than 80% of the stuff that's out there. And I'm looking at you, Insomnia and Dark Knight Rises. Mm-hmm. But regardless... And Dark Knight Rises... Like, in, when did Dark Knight Rises dude, become a bad film? In what world is Dark Knight because Rises... Because we're comparing it to Dark Knight, you know? <laughs> which was such... Exactly. At the time, it's, it was such a precedent. A Dark and it's Knight hard too. not to compare it to Dark Knight. <laughs> I mean... But well, it's, yeah. I think, you know, had tragedy not struck and Heath Ledger prematurely passed away, Dark Knight Rises would have been a fantastic movie with Man. his original plan. You yeah, know? I agree. I agree. I got to give it to you, bro. Yeah. Um, Christopher, a lot of it is because I've followed his career as a teenager. I remember in 2000 watching Memento. Memento, man. And being blown away. Who, I, I couldn't even have guessed that it was going back. Man, I, you no did it, it was incredible. I was like, I've never <laughs> no. even thought to even watch something like this. And I remember after, you know, having that feeling initially of like Pulp Fiction, but then I watched Memento and I'm like, oh, wow. All right, I'm chasing this guy. <laughs> All right, he's chasing me. <laughs> like, like there's just a great concept. The tattoos, you're piecing it together. And there's something to be said for discovering Carrie Ann Moss as well. Yeah. Amazing. Wait, was that? Yeah, that was after she Matrix. Was, I mean, that had to have been around the same. Yeah, that was after. Matrix. Was it after Matrix? Matrix okay. was like ninety eight, ninety nine. It was right, it, maybe it was around the same time. Well, I'm, I'll it was say probably this. around the same time. I will say the the Matrix was not huge in theaters. I would say she was more before Revolutions. She was almost in certain circles more well known for Memento than she was for the Matrix. Possibly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Possibly, but, but I, I, it's just the care that he puts into his yeah, movies. Yeah, Memento like, you, was, and what he did yeah. with so less. It was such a small budget film. Memento mm-hmm. is Memento is looked upon as when you when you go to film school, we were studying that shot for shot. Okay, yeah. shout out to, uh, rest in peace, uh, Professor Frank Avila, Doctor Frank Avila. We talked about that film a lot, and and how it, we all knew that Memento was the movie that went backward. But you, 
even knowing that going into the theater, it didn't ruin it for you. You didn't know. It still didn't say anything. You're like, wait a minute. How? You had to watch it over and over again. You're like, how? Man, how did he do this? How does it tell this story? You know? And no other director could have told that story the same way. Like, there's even been a show on ABC or NBC that was about this this lady who had tattoos all over her body to remind her of what's going on. And it didn't work the same way that Memento worked, you know? Yeah. And you know they had to be inspired by that because no one talked about something like that before that film came out. So, no. Derek. You're number uh, one. We're we're still we're still on it, so you're good. <laughs> like Interstellar, <laughs> Nolan is number yeah, one. Interstellar was a great film. Interstellar, Interstellar, Inception. man. When I when I think of Christopher Nolan, I think of Interstellar, The Dark Knight, and Inception all at once. Interstellar just, is a Interstellar oh, is a good dude, example. Don't, but the Prestige, yeah. man. Oh man, the Prestige. The prestige. Ah, yeah. man. Y'all know how much I love that movie. Heck yeah, Prestige, bro. <laughs> Like just Ugh. exactly that reaction right there is why he's my that number one. Movie that reaction does it for me. The you know what I mean? Does I will, it for me. Uh, your reaction that and you it's just a had, movie. I will, honestly that shouldn't even work. It shouldn't. <laughs> I'm telling you, I got. I'm gonna tell you, I got so much flack for giving, um, for giving, um, um, the prestige. prestige. Yeah, a sci-fi credit. But every critic who knows what they're talking about agrees with me. What the reason why it doesn't, it, it shouldn't work, is because it takes place in a time where there was not much technology, mm-hmm. and the film is also about magic, but it's not about real magic. It's about the the. It's an illusion, Michael. Magician at that. It's all yes, an illusion. It's about Michael. that. Yeah, and and they call technology magic, and I, that's why I love like in Thor Ragnarok, or not Thor Ragnarok, but in the original Thor, where he says. What you call technology in your world, we call magic. Like it's no. What you call magic, we call science. Science, yeah. exactly. That's yeah. it. Exactly, science. Exactly, and that's essentially what they don't understand at that period of time. Michael Caine calls it real magic, but it's just science. It's Nikola Tesla, and uh, yeah. and Andy Serkis. On top of that, dude, man. So anyway, mm-hmm. man. I'm talking about giving him a real see, acting. See, man. the way that you reacted. Don't get me started. I can't. I, I'm telling yeah. you. The way that you reacted, man, I can't. <sighs> man, so many good films. Yeah, I can't. Christopher, it's yeah. like. Go ahead. His love for actually filming and film using as much practical effects as he can. Like this dude. Long shots, Built a man. revolving just, hallway. Yes. Just mm-hmm. so he could film a hallway fight. So it didn't have to yeah, look terribly on no, wires. <laughs> There would be no yeah. as uh, there would be no um, Doctor Strange as we know it without Christopher Nolan. Because <laughs> man, that they whole, took that cue without yeah. Inception, there would that's have been no Doctor Strange. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm absolutely. saying. Absolutely, I, I agree with that 100. percent All right, yeah. so well, I'm gonna have to break up the love shack because I um, I went in a different uh, direction with my number one. You can yeah, hop in my car. As much it as I love him. Much as I love him, um, there's someone I love just a little bit more. And of all these directors, of all these directors, they all have a flair. All the directors we talked about, they all have a flair for taking fiction and making it tangible. But there's a director that we have not talked about in this top five yet that has the ability to take real stories find the stuff that happens in front of us all day long and says this is what a movie should be about what's real magic isn't the stuff that's fantastical it's the the people and and stuff that happen that are too that happen that are too fantastical for the casual small talk of the streets the stuff that happens that if someone told you you'd call them a liar okay but this man makes amazing films and he invented the based on the true story. And this is Martin Scorsese. Okay. Um, this, he has amazing storytelling. Um, he's able to show what people loved about the mob era. What, what people loved about, you know, the periods of time when 
maybe I wouldn't want to go back in time in a time capsule and see what it was like because black people wasn't doing so well. But my wife might would love to go back into those times and see what things were like back then. You know, it's it's um, every time I see a Martin Scorsese film, it's inspired by something that really did happen. It's actually really plausible and it bends the mind of what how did this happen and how did these things come together like this and then you find out that a guy who was in a scene really was the guy that killed somebody mm-hmm. in the in, in the real life scene. like are you killing me are you kidding kidding me like i'm i'm watching i'm watching mo- these movies with my wife and i'm like that's the guy who actually killed the guy in real life what are you kidding me yes, yes like that's i mean and, and and he doesn't do it with special effects he doesn't do it with super huge budgets and if he does do it super huge budgets it's just to pay the actors to get them to come on set ensemble the original ensemble cast director timeless films um i know people love francis ford coppola but you know they he he can't stand toe to toe with mark scorsese and mark scorsese has done television as well dude so um, man yeah, yeah this that's a freaking resume you know what i'm saying yeah, like Goodfellas, Casino, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Bringing Out the Dead, that was a crazy movie. You Get know what it. I'm saying? Uh, Get it. Shutter Island, like, you Get know, it. The Departed. You know, Departed. You, there you, know, there you go. The Aviator, like, you know this man. Yes. This man, like, way this. to the future, man. Yeah, it was way the way for the future. The, you know what I mean? The Taxi aviator, Driver, man. man. Ta- Raging Bull. Bro. Come on, man. You looking at me? You talking to me? <laughs> exactly. You talking to me? A quote I'm that is probably you, heard on the, the daily <laughs> from that movie. I'm telling you, a lot of people give a lot of people give Francis Ford Coppola credit for really discovering um, Robert De Niro, but Robert De Niro became Robert De Niro under the guise yeah. of um, of okay. Sp- Martin Scorsese. Absolutely. Like the the stuff you love about him, they came through Martin Scorsese films. <clears throat> period. I know Nate really liked Silence. Well, yeah. Well. Did you guys watch it yet? <laughs> no, I haven't seen it. Right. Haven't After seen I it. finish Iron Fist, that's when I'm going to watch it. <laughs> uh. Never. Which means never. By the way, something we did not mention with Steven Spielberg. We didn't even. I got to go back. I got to reach back real quick. But, and we're going to talk about this because now it's time to do oh, the full rundown. Time. Final round. We got to come. We, we got to come together. We got to. Right now, over me, we got to give people the exclusives <laughs> before we round it out. Player, we have man. to agree on a top five, okay? And we're basing it on story, scale, and success, okay? So here's where those three come in to, to whittle it down. All right, so number one, I'm going to automatically give to... Um, we have two people that we each have on our list. So well, we're no, going but, with story. but there's one that tied for number one. There's so two Nolan goes number, number one, one automatically. Well, I was gonna say Spiel, Spiel, Spielberg. Nolan goes no. Okay, but he didn't tie. Oh, for you meant tie for number one? Okay, who's higher on the list? Yeah, that's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, they yeah. tie for number one, so he automatically gets number one. All right. Okay, and then Steven Spielberg was on two of our. On was he on all three or just two? It was on yeah, two because the mech has got on yours. All three. So I would say no, no. He was he on was, all three. Spielberg was my number two. Yeah. So he's on all yeah. three. So he would be number two. Yeah. On all. Mm-hmm. So he'd be a number two. Number three is where we're gonna have an argument. Okay. So who's I'm number fine three? with going Scorsese for number three. Hey, my, he, there you he go, my, my friend. Uh, he was an honorable mention, and I, I love Wolf of Wall Street. Hey, love man, Wolf just of when Wall he, Street. When he pop it and lock it, I'm like, you got some good <laughs> acting right now. You know he can't dance, but he, he method acted doing pop and lock. I guarantee, if you ask Leo to pop and lock right now, he couldn't do it. <laughs> On top of that, Steven Spielberg. Before we move along, move along, Steven Spielberg. We didn't even we didn't. He's done so well that we didn't even talk. And this is and Steven Spielberg goes hand in hand with uh, with Lucasfilm on this. George Lucas is um, Indiana. We didn't even talk about Indiana Jones exactly. When Nate was talking a little something something about Lucasfilm, yeah, uh, y'all forget about Indiana Jones. I get that the last one wasn't all that great, but Indiana Jones is Indiana Jones, bro. Come on, man. <laughs> who? So get, put some respect on my man's name, which I which I moved to put as number four, George Lucas. No, <laughs> <laughs> you have two films. You I have so- Star Wars and Apocalypse Now. That's it. Yeah, you were, did all this other cool stuff, but I can't. I, like, so what, man? So what? 
Like, <laughs> like, get him out of here. Well, he didn't have two films. The, first and foremost, you can't say that. His last two film franchises, we had Star Wars, and then we have Apocalypse franchises, Now. Franchises, exactly. He has Star exactly. Wars, and then before franchises. that was Apocalypse Now. That's it. That's it. That's all he's directed in the last 40 years. <laughs> two. And Wait, that's eight. Apocalypse that's now at least eight films. Cop- Coppola. Well, yeah. Whatever. What? No. Yeah. You mean American Graffiti. That's what I meant. Yeah, American that graffiti. one. American Graffiti. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but we're, yeah, we're talking yeah. about... That's like... Not, so, that all right. Far away let's talk from about your three Lucas films. You and on episode top of that, one, Lucas two, and three. Did you love episodes one, two, and three? From your good director? And the logo at the beginning... And the logo at the beginning of Indiana Jones is Lucasfilm. All right, so... Yeah, but that's him producing. He didn't direct it, though. So, all right. So, you're telling me half of his Look, George Lucas as a visionary... Is yes, he's amazing, but as a director, no. Episodes no, one, two, and three prequels. are half of the sexology <laughs> yeah. that so, he directed. So half bad, movies. half terrible. <laughs> he, so so terrible which, so movies. what y'all are saying is y'all would more so credit George Lucas as a top three producer? Then would you say that? Yeah, yes. definitely, okay. no yes, question. Right. Visionary. Yes. I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. He to could. He could go number one. Honestly, you yeah. win. You won already. Yeah. All right, moving <laughs> on. <laughs> Yo, number four, then Alfred Hitchcock. Then I'm with that on Hitchcock. He was on both lists. I'm good with that. All right, Hitchcock I'm is four, and then five. I'm... Zemeckis was a good one, man. We didn't have another double. I, I mean, I can't give it to Zemeckis. Well, though. actually, we you guys mentioned Tarantino. Tarantino, I'd say yeah. before yeah. Zemeckis. Did you have Tarantino on your list? Okay, okay, I didn't remember. Yeah, he was he an did. honorable mention. Oh, honorable mine. mention. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, cool. I thought he was on your. Oh, he's Derek, on my he's list. On he's Derek's on my list. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. There you go. There you go. I'm All right, with that. so here we go. So our official uh, top five is order from five all the way down. Number five. Tarantino. Yeah. Number four. Hitchcock. Number three. Uh, Help me out. Scorsese. 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 Number two. Help me out. Eli Spielberg. Eli. <laughs> Spielberg. Number two. <laughs> <laughs> number one. Spielberg is number two. And, and number one number is one. Nolan. There we go. So those are our top five, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between. With all due respect, we have given you a weekly top five best director of all time, and we always did it. The player way. Exactly right. We killed that thing. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, with all due respect, shouts out to my co-captains, Nate. That's me. And Derek. That's me. You already know who it is. Corrupting the system as well. Corrupting the art world. Anything. Corrupting anything. Anything. There you go. Anything coming up this weekend uh, in the theaters that we need to be watching out for? Yes. You have the hat on right now. There you go. I helped you. I seeded that for you. (laughs) Deadpool. We have a little bit of time. Deadpool predictions, y'all. What are y'all thinking? I think it's time for a little bit of a gentleman's bet. Oh, Bets, it. bets, bets. Place your bets here. We got a gentleman bet right over here. Let's get it going, boys. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The man's shirt. You can't see him right now, but Derek's shirt, it definitely says the Playaway Podcast presents the Captain's Challenge. And the Captain's Challenge will come out tomorrow, Friday, if you are listening to this at the right time and place. It'll be Flame on Friday. And, and you'll watch Derek and I Suck on the toe of Satan. That's what you're going to see us doing. But after you see us stomach all sides, all sorts of capsaicin, all right, you're going to then go to the movie theater. You're going to watch a little man named Ryan Reynolds. He's going to revitalize the little bit of respect what that Fox has left. <laughs> all right? Uh. He's going to take on Manchester United. And a really awesome commercial that I thought was pretty cool, actually, that came out this week. That's right. And it will be his time as Deadpool. All right. So, the Playway Podcast, we usually do our uh, box office hustle. But since this is closer to Friday, I just move that we do it on the Thursday show. So, here we go. Captains, what is your prediction for box office draw for Deadpool 2? 150 million. That'd be tough. <laughs> I was going to say. That is what I was going to say. I'm throwing it out first this time. Yeah. I I, Look, the first one opened to 132. I think it can beat that. The only problem is I think Infinity War has legs. Man, it does. And and, 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 Deadpool uh, is 
Deadpool yeah. is rated R, so those people, yes. those like families, young kids, they're going to take their kids to the And Deadpool benefited from being during a weekend that usually doesn't do very well for superhero films, which is Valentine's weekend. Yeah. So that it was is, that is completely so, true. So it was a different time of year. Um, but it, we are get, it. School is out though for the summer, so it's it's about Shout that time for kids to get out there and and do that. Some, yeah, some new brand. Derek- since Derek, real quick, said 150, I'll go 145. I mean, here's what I'm gonna say. I, I agree with you that there. If you haven't seen this commercial, if you go to the group chat that I got told to you guys about, and ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between, if you're listening, there, if go to go to YouTube, search Manchester United Deadpool two. They he did a cross. They did a cross brand commercial with Manchester United, which I think is genius. Because that is the fastest growing sport in America right now, and if not worldwide, um, <laughs> it I'm, is I'm not quite a fan one. yet. Ian Robert Parsons <laughs> the most is popular sport, sport on the planet. I said, I said fastest <laughs> growing though as well though. It's the fastest growing as well um, because it's uh, it already grew. It's already, it's already grew. Yeah, it's been the most it's popular. The best, it, oh, it's been oh, the oh, most oh, popular y'all, sport y'all, on y'all, the planet for fifty years. <laughs> Okay, first yes. of all, did y'all listen to what I said? I said you said fastest, fastest growing, growing in America, America, and then you said and fastest Whoa, growing what, in the world. Co- what else is there? And then you said fastest Compared growing in the world. world. Okay, then, so I'm right. So just say I'm right and move on. <laughs> Jesus. All right, y'all going to make me cuss on this show. It is the fastest growing sport in America, bar none. Yes. I, I, yeah, you yeah, can not find in the world. out all the equestrian sports. All right, there's a lot of people. Derek, do you know who, name one name one person on Manchester United right now? Exactly. Exactly. That's why I'm saying it's the fastest growing sport in America. No one knows about it, but we're all talking about it right now. And Deadpool decided to do a commercial with them instead of the Dallas Cowboys. So that tells you it's the fastest growing sport in America. Tells they got them that Jerry Jones post. didn't want Moving to be associated on. with Deadpool. He wants that worldwide box office, not that U.S. domestic <laughs> exactly. box office. Exactly. That's Moving why. on. Jeez. Appeal to the rest of the world. People, hear me. Y- y'all y'all feel my pain. Y'all know exactly what I'm dealing with. I said nothing yeah, wrong. Soccer has narrowly beaten out cricket. <laughs> as the <laughs> fastest growing and most popular sport in America. Versus UFC. <laughs> All right. I, I still win. Anyway, UFC I do my research before I say anything on this show. Anyway, the only thing that UFC, we were poking out, you said UFC, fastest growing in the world. And we were just pointing out that it's already been the largest in the world. That's all we were pointing and out. It's still, and it's still continuing to grow. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, 100%. Next to UFC and football and other things. Okay. Anyway, I can't believe we're arguing about this. This is so dumb. Anyway, uh, moving <laughs> on. Um, Deadpool 2. <laughs> The directors identified Manchester United as the number one team to do a uh, to do a commercial with, um, with the risk of people in America not making it not making sense to us. But they did it anyway. And uh, at the end of the at the end of the uh, commercial, he specifically says, "Hey, gotta double down on that marketing when you're going up against Infinity War." So like that, <laughs> I love that he's calling Perfect. it out. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. That's perfect. So I think, yeah. honestly, exactly. So I think, I think they're they're pulling out all the stops. They're doing a very different type of marketing. And and Nate, you know how we love marketing here, man. So um, so exactly. So um, I believe that it's going to do well, but not as well as it did previously. Um, it may have a longer burn believe, though, just because of that though. Exactly. I think I think we're looking at one twenty five. Ooh, that's me. Right. Opening weekend, at least, yeah. And wait a minute, we're not—we don't have like a no, and we definitely don't have a four-way four-day weekend coming up, right? Nope. No. Okay, so I'm sticking with that 125. But Follow Memorial on. Day is the next weekend, so it'll probably have a good chunk there. That'll probably. Have oh yeah, I think. In fact, I think it's going to have a, a a better. Better. If this is the right, if this is the right grammar, it's going to have a better drop off rate than Infinity War did. Infinity War actually didn't have a very good drop off the second week. I mean, it went from uh, two fifty seven down to like one twenty. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. But when you look, but when you look at percentages, I mean, that's huge. But it still did like sixty um, this, this past week. Again, weekend, again, again. But Forbes talked about how it had an unpredictably worse second week. Y'all need to stop arguing with me. Y'all better stop it. Anyway, no one's arguing. No one's <laughs> arguing. I'm just <laughs> providing the numbers that they've been doing. That's it. I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So we got 125, 145, and 150? Yes. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone between, I've been your resident podcast DJ BK, helping you understand how to curate your life and media. Ooh. Irrit, irrit, irrit. There we go. <laughs> exactly. 
And along with my co-captains Nate and Derek And Nate, send us off right I hope they remember you Indeed We'll see y'all next week This has been the Weekly Top 5 Podcast, presented by Play Your Way Network and Agency Cartel Clothing Company, the official clothing for grind time. And as always, recorded in a single take between Los Angeles, California, Dallas, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia, featuring Nathan Peterson, Derek Lewis, and VK Jackson. Special thanks to our senior writer, Ian Parsons, And I'm Darren Marlar, showing you how to narrate the player way.